and we actually have a very special edition of Let's Talk. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce our new teaching pastor, Dr. Troy Doucette. Yes. And am I saying that correctly? Because I yeah. I've been saying Doucet, <laughs> and Doucet, Doucet feels more Louisiana. Doucet is the the proper print uh, French pronunciation of of that last name, but Doucet is it's widely pronounced that way in Louisiana. But really? it comes from a uh, derivative of like dolce, right? So sweet, okay. so to be sweet, and so yeah, so, nice. Yeah, nice. Well, we're we're really excited to have you here. Um, we've been on the hunt for another teaching pastor to add to the team uh, for a long time. Cool. And uh, Larry and I were um, going through a lot of uh, resumes and interviews, and yeah. um, there were a lot of things about your resume that uh, caught our attention. Um, but I wanted to start with just you telling your story, you know, how you, uh, where you were born and, yeah. and just take us from the beginning <laughs> all the way to where you are now. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure how far back we wanted. Oh, we're I'm, going all the way back. I'm pretty old, yeah. man. You yeah, know, all right. pushing 50 here, dude. And no, you're like mid forties. Yeah, yeah. So no, you're good. Yeah. But I'm almost there. Yeah. <laughs> but I was, bo- I was born in a small town in South Louisiana called Opelousas, Louisiana, that maybe 15,000 people. And uh, my mom had me. She was real young. I think she was 16. Oh, wow. Maybe 17 at the time of my, when I was born. And uh, she was a single mom for a long time, and it was just she and I, man. And I was a little, I was a little turd, you know, spoiled. <laughs> and so with that, I, I spent a lot of time with my, my grandparents growing up because she would work, and I would go to daycare and then go to my grandma's house. And my mom was one of nine children, and that was just typical of a South Louisiana family back then. And so I learned how to cook from my grandma, oh, wow. uh, raise cattle with my grandfather, and they both since passed on, but they were very uh, formative mm-hmm. uh, in my in my hard work. I think both of them had like eighth grade educations, and they pushed me to you know always be better. But it was just me and my mom, and then now you know um, it's. Uh, it's always good to go back to those roots because a long, for a long time, man, I was really like many young guys growing up in Louisiana. You become it, the word Cajun becomes associated with like ignorance and um, sort of this miseducation or uneducation. And, but yet, I look back like I'm very proud of that heritage, sure. man. The food, the culture, um, and, I, and, and I the language. Love Cajun food. I will just put that out there right now. Oh, sweet. So if you're a master at Let's cooking go. Cajun food, I, I got to have some. Yeah, it's funny. The other night I uh, I made a pot of uh, some shrimp and corn uh, soup, which is a, a kind of a down home. Think of it like a chowder, but okay. Cajun style. And I brought some to uh, to Pastor Larry's house and he texts me a couple of minutes later. He's like, "Ooh wee. <laughs> he goes, this thing got some kick, man. And he goes, but you're hired. Let's go. And I was like, all right, at least that's what sealed the deal. That's, huh? that's what yeah. sealed it. So I was raised there, man. And uh, I was the first one in my family to go to college and uh, went to LSU. And so I'm a tiger. And I started out majoring I was a pre-medicine major man I had this desire I wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon and um, during that time period at some point I became interested in a young lady and in South Louisiana most people are raised Catholic and that's what I was raised I was okay. raised Catholic and uh, the girl I was interested in when I was working part-time at Win dixie uh, in the meat department nice uh, she went to this church called word of faith and it was in a bigger city up the road called Lafayette, Lafayette, Louisiana. And so, uh, the only way she would let me date her is if I went to church with her. And so of course I walk into this church, man. And again, I'm used to the Catholicism, the liturgy, you know, the Eucharist. And so you hadn't stepped into a Christian church prior to that? Nothing, nothing like this, right? Nothing that had this sort of fervent, ardent, impassioned worship and I'm walking in there and people's hands are lifted. Um, uh, there was one guy like do you, I don't know if you remember the MC hammer, like the shuffle, Okay, yeah. the, the typewriter. <laughs> he was at the front of the altar doing this MC hammer move. There was dancing. One lady had this flag. She was, <laughs> that sounds like, like my church growing up. Yeah. yeah, she was, yeah. I guess she was trying to flag down God or yeah, something like we're yeah. here and something resonated in me 
uh, with that passion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it stuck. And the youth minister at the time uh, just saw something in me and he began to give me leadership opportunities and that's when I began to feel that call to ministry. And so, so you I, were about like 18 or so at this so time? So at that time, that would have been, what, nine? Yeah, I was like 19 or 20 okay. at the time. And uh, that's when I put going to school to become a doctor on the back burner and really focused on ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my start in ministry. And I just continued to do that for quite a few years. I started in children's ministry as a children's minister. They just threw me to the wolves, yeah, yeah. which are first through fifth graders, right, you know, right. and then I became a junior high youth minister and then an associate youth minister for uh, high school and college back in Louisiana. Okay. And then I think it was in 2002, uh, I, uh, I had a friend move to Dallas. Um, his name was Ty and he got a job at Texas Instruments. And a year prior to that, I was at, I, was, I think it was at a conference in, in Dallas, and it was an evangelism conference on strategies to grow church and ministry. And something told me, like, you'll be, you need to come to Dallas. I think it was just the city was freaking amazing, yeah. and it wasn't Louisiana. <laughs> and here's an opportunity. My buddy Ty was attending a church called Fellowship of Frisco. And uh, they were looking for a youth minister. And so Ty dropped my name without me knowing. And I began to talk to the senior pastor there. And next thing you know, I packed up everything I owned in a, in a 1993 Toyota Celica. <laughs> I miss those cars. Dude. And it was a convertible, dude. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah. I, I drove to uh, to Dallas, and I stayed with with Ty and his wife, and they were very gracious to, to kind of put me up. And we began – that was my – I think my first, like, full-time – and that was 2002, man. Oh, wow. And I think it was a little while later I said, well, let me pick up the education piece again because mm – -hmm. I had always had this thirst for knowledge. So at this knowledge. point, you had not? I had not continued. Okay. So it, would be, it had been, what, four years, four or five years okay. that I had not pursued any education. And so uh, that's when I picked up that education mantle again. I think it was 2003 and just began to shift gears from biology, zoology, pre-medicine and into theology and philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that, I think it was 2003. And Why the philosophy route? You know, I mean, if you run to be a minister, usually they just folk, they have like a focus on theology. Yeah. What drew you to philosophy? So um, I went to Liberty to, okay. do, to finish the, the degree correspondently because I was working full time. I was married at the time. And Liberty just offered this sort of convenience. And I had an option, so this is pretty awesome, to either – pay $300 a credit hour for this, for their class in philosophy and humanities, or I can go to the local community college and take an evening course or whatever for like $40 a credit yeah. hour. <laughs> yeah. And Liberty said, we'll take that as a, you know, awesome. credit. So I walk into my first, cause I hadn't taken philosophy. I was taking human anatomy, comparative anatomy, zoology, biology at LSU. And so I walk into my first philosophy class not knowing what to expect. I'm expecting like this old guy to come out with a beard and be like, well, today we're going to talk about, uh, now I'm but the professor came in, uh, his name was Levi and rocked my world, man. Here I was a youth minister who believed fervently in a particular idea of God and a particular idea of what salvation was. And he kicked my butt yeah just wrecked your world oh he wrecked me yeah. wrecked me every response i had he had a very rational and and sort of logical sort of approach to to answering those questions and it changed it really like changed the scope of how i began to approach even you know theological studies and i told him at the end of the class i i said man i said once i'm done with this degree i'm gonna go get my master's and I said, but I think I'll do a double master's in theology and philosophy and I'm gonna call you because mm -hmm. you you kicked my tail and I, <laughs> revenge is coming. He was like, hey, <laughs> you have my email. Yeah. And so I did, so I, I finished uh, you because- You really like school to double master in something. Yeah, yeah. dude, it was, it was awesome. And, and I finished the undergrad 
through Liberty because I had all these credits from LSU that transferred. And nice. then I went and I did a double master's in philosophy and theology at uh, the Criswell College in Dallas. And when I finished that, um, I, I sent Levi an email. And uh, he was like, oh, it's great to hear from you. It's been a couple of years. And I was like, let's grab some coffee or let's get our families together. He was like, why don't you guys come over for dinner? Um, and this must have been what? This was probably 2008. I think it was 2008. Okay. And we showed up uh, to his house. And usually you show up and you serve food. But the, the, the table was already set. Oh, wow. And we walked in and we began to eat eat and then he and I just began to talk and our wives began to talk and they immediately connected and he and I reconnected and we were there till like one in the morning just talking philosophy and you know having a couple of drinks and I, I guess you know in vino veritas right like mm -hmm. the truth comes out he goes I know when you walked in you saw this table was set I said yeah it was kind of strange man but I just thought that's how you midwesterners do it you know and he's like no man like we thought you were coming here to convert us to Christianity. We just wanted to feed you, talk, and then get you the hell out. <laughs> and I started laughing, and he was like, honestly, man, I got to get you teaching. And I said, what do I do? And it was from there I got a call from the college where he was, where I'd taken the class, mm -hmm. inviting me to come and interview. And that was the year I began, I became Professor Doucet and oh, wow. started teaching philosophy, ethics, comparative religion. And uh, yeah, man. And so I did that for a while while still working at a church. Okay. But that was part of my deconstruction as well. The more texts that I read and the more engagement I had with, you know, diverse student populations and whatnot um, really caused me to begin to question a lot of things. And so where did you, so where, remind me where you took your master's, uh, like your master, where you did your master's program. It was at the, the Criswell College. Criswell, okay. Which is, it's sort of. Is that of, a Christian college? It is, okay. it is. So Liberty was Christian. Right. And deeply fundamentally Baptist and Criswell right. too. Now it was a struggle to choose Criswell, but it was convenient and it was, it wasn't very expensive and they were regionally accredited. So how do they how do they tackle the honesty of theological studies at a fundamental Christian college in this in the sense of like let's be honest about a lot of what the discrepancies between what mainstream evangelicalism is teaching and the actual like solid foundation of scholarship in theology. Well, I think the way I think all Christian seminaries that have sort of that more conservative bend, mm -hmm. they're scholars within their own sort of paradigm. Gotcha. Right? So, Pull that uh, mic just a little closer. Oh, sorry, yeah. No worries. So yeah, they would be considered scholars in their, their own sort of paradigm. And so they sort of read each other's work and critique it, but they, they basically fall. So it becomes a kind of an echo chamber of scholarship. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And so, but I had a professor there. I'm not going to name him. I don't mm -hmm. want to out him, but he was he was instrumental in in really encouraging me to read those th those thinkers that he knew I was really curious. So someone like Frederick Nietzsche mm -hmm. or Martin Heidegger, Maurice Merleau Ponty, like these guys who really challenged the Christian faith and some of the the assertions that were made. Mm -hmm. And um, when I decided to go for the PhD, it was I, there was no question. I said, I'm not going to a Christian college. Yeah. I said, I want to have some sort of secular, if you will, if mm -hmm. I can use that, where I use it very loosely. I need, I need a, on my resume, I need something from a secular university. If I'm going to have any sort of credential or, you know. Well, and Pastor Larry made the same decision. You know, he, he did his uh, schooling in uh, Nazarene uh, in Tribeca, you know, which mm -hmm. he, he, he does say that the, even though Tribeca is pretty fundamental uh, Christian, yep. um, their seminary was a little bit more intellectually honest. And, That's, yeah. You know, it wasn't as like echo chamber as w what sounds like uh, your experience was. But then he, he did his PhD at FSU. Yeah, and, and that's amazing. Yeah, and I was the black sheep of of Criswell for a long time, mm -hmm. mostly because most not even because of because most of my questioning and deconstruction, even in a Jacques Derridian sense, was hidden. Most of the most of the debates were like theological debates about Calvinism and mm -hmm. 
you know, Arminianism and free will and middle knowledge and, right. you know, stuff like that. Because I was, anytime I would sort of approach a friend about the questions that I had concerning some of these dogmatic positions of the church that were more grounded historically than rationally, mm -hmm. it was always something's wrong with you. Something's wrong with you. Something's wrong with your walk with God and something's yeah. wrong with... So they start questioning your relationship with absolutely. God. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm like, there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with me. I just, I just, some of this is not cogent, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and um, so when I enrolled at University of Texas at Dallas and started doing the philosophy program there, uh, it was like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Like it was, it was a whole new environment. The, even the rigor was much different than the Christian scholarship and rigor that was required at the at those universities. Not taking anything against, but it was a particular type of rigor sure. that you can be rigorous as long as the answer still is within line, yeah. funnels down here. Right. And at UT Dallas was really where I began to become more of a, a true free thinker mm -hmm. and had sort of, you know, this, this boundless horizon to ask questions and engage with like world renowned scholars mm -hmm. in their fields of critical theory, literary studies, mm -hmm. philosophy, humanities, history. And I was like a kid in a candy store, man. And I think professors were like, what the hell is he doing here again? Right. Like, but I think they really enjoyed that engagement too. Sure. And so, yeah. So, um, I did that, man. I enrolled in the PhD program and I, I wrote this paper and one of the professors there who was on my committee, Dr. John Gooch, um, he said, Hey man, there's, there's this, uh, this conference coming up at the university of Oxford. I think your paper would be awesome for this particular, you know, do you remember the subject of the paper? Yeah, it was, uh, what did, what was it? Um, Heidegger and a phenomenological reading of the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, okay. And so I basically took Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and gave sort of this hermeneutical, phenomenological interpretation of what Jesus was actually saying from a Heideggerian standpoint. Okay. And so uh, I was just, I couldn't believe my paper was accepted uh, because it was a two-day conference and there were only 12 papers accepted out of everyone wow. applying. And so I remember getting there and I'm in a room of like 200 scholars from just around the world. And I gave the reading, um, gave my lecture and then began to entertain questions. And I was just, I felt alive and yeah. I knew I was in the right place. And then one of the guys there uh, who was in the crowd, um, uh, Vince, Vince, I think it was Vince Vitale who invited me, he said, man, you should apply for a, PGC postgraduate studies here, and so I did. And um, at so, Oxford, at Oxford, okay. And so I went. I actually was awarded a doctoral fellowship uh, there, and went back. And so I lectured there a couple of times, man. And you know, it looks great on the resume. There's a lot of charm of these English institutions, sure. but yeah. I just, I, I just go. I mean, the beer was great. <laughs> the beer was freaking amazing yeah. over there, and the conversations. Because right. you, you walk into a, any sort of pub here. Mm -hmm. And there are mil a million televisions trying to distract you. In in England, in Oxford, there's no TV. No, yeah. it smells like old wood, and yeah. the beer is room temperature, and you're forced into these dialogical conversations about things that I, I feel matter, whether mm -hmm. we're talking about God, politics, or whatever, man. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was it was eye opening experience, man. And then you come back to reality, and you got to pick up writing your dissertation and, and find the passion that you first felt on this particular topic and subject. And yeah, and it's a, uh, it was awesome, man. So, so your PhD is in humanities in humanities okay. and the history of ideas, okay. which is essentially philosophy. Okay. Everything's philosophical, right? Right, right? I remember I had a student in my class look at me and he's like, you know, Dr. Doucet, I just don't think we need all this philosophy. And I'm like, that's a very interesting philosophy yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and it, it, it takes it takes you aback man yeah. but uh but yeah that's my my education story man and i defended my dissertation um in 2019 what was your dis uh, dissertation it was uh, the title the the technical legal title is excarnation a phenomenology of technology 
and religious experience. Okay. Well, so it has some break psycho- that down to a one on one level. Yeah, over here. <laughs> man. So it, it has a lot of it's 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 a philosophical work, um, mostly from the work of Martin Heidegger. Okay. Uh, but there's a lot of Frederick Nietzsche in there, and another guy uh, from Canada named uh, Charles Taylor. And it's basically a work of how does technology sort of influence, implicate our existence today? Because we think of technology as gadgetry, like these microphones or whatever. But Heidegger didn't see technology as like gadgets. That was a manifestation of it. But technology was actually a way of like thinking about being and existence that was influenced all the way to what we'd call like the pre-Socratic Greeks. Um, And there was a tragedy that was sort of, you know, comedy tragedy. It was a tragic situation for us humans because we often use technology to try to overcome nature. Okay. Right? But nature always wins, right? You build a wall, nature knocks it over, right? Right. And uh, you build a trap, and then the bear attacks you. and. So the I think Greek, we forget that, like in living in society nowadays, is yeah. like nature's always trying to kill you. Yeah, like it's just always trying to take you over. It is, <laughs> and so you know, technology was again. We build gadgets, and the word in Greek is techne, and the word the Greeks use for nature is physis. And so Heidegger does, I think, in my opinion, a brilliant job of juxtaposing that consistent tension and tragedy, but. The way I look at it is, is like now we're in such a, a cultural position now. This is what my the argument I'm making my dissertation is. Everything seems to be anthropocentric because of technological thinking. We've overcome nature for the most part uh, until it flares up really hardcore. Right. Right. But um, the idea here is, I'll ask students this: like, what does a tree do? And there's a pause. Like, what's a tree? And they're like, well, it 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 provides shade. It grows fruit. We use it for homes. It beautifies our yard. And I go, do you think the tree cares that it gives you shade or produces fruit for you to eat or beautifies your yard? No. We project that meaning and significance onto the tree. And so I'll say it this way, and it it makes students, I go, the tree, trees. (laughs) That's what it does. But because we have centered ourselves as the height of existence and being. Top of the food chain. Yeah. Yeah. Like that tree. I mean, you go to. It works for us. It works for us, right? And rivers as well. Like river, we swim in them, we use them for transportation. I go, no, a river, rivers. A river doesn't care that it's floating your boat. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to, it'll sink it without even apologizing, you know? And so what the problem is not that, it's when we begin to sort of appropriate that onto other beings. Okay. When I start thinking technologically about you, that, well, Ricardo's only as good as he is useful to me. Mm-hmm. And so that's the danger. And so I make a slight, you know, bait and switch on now, how does that implicate religious experience with that mind of thinking? And then that's when... I really, I go hard on the evangelical church and that dissertation on, mm. yeah, they're techne, they're, they're technological in their way of appropriating the understanding of the gospel and salvation. And you're only as good as you are if you follow this rule, mm. right? If you're not this and you're not that. And so... You that know. sounds amazing. I want to read that. Yeah, if so you still have it. I, it's it's boring as hell, man. No, I can it's imagine. It's 250 this. pages, Oof. but I was very I was passionate about that work. Um, not so much like, you know, because I have there's a there's you know there's the, the evangelical church is always going to have a place in my heart, man. Sure. It, it was it was very uh, it was deeply formative for me to at least being introduced to the person of Christ. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. I think there's a lot of people that experience a lot of trauma growing up in evangelical church, and and I'm sure I carry some trauma. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I I do look, I am thankful for mm-hmm. my experience growing up in evangelical church. Like I met a lot of really amazing people, and this is where I was introduced to Jesus. Like I I'm thankful for that experience, and you know, no experience is without trauma, right? That's right. So I think um, I think. I, I try to focus on the the good. That's good, man. Yeah. I'm I'm with you. I think we we're we're in a, we're in a day and age where kind of like me at 
at the evangelical seminary, I had to hide some of the doubts and questions. Um, there's a philosopher I love uh, out of Tufts University. His name's Daniel Dennett. He wrote a book called Breaking the Spell, how, how religion corrupts everything. And it's an amazing work. And he kind of breaks this taboo. He says religion should be sort of placed under the same sort of scrutiny and criticism as anything else. There's no taboo mm -hmm. as to why religious belief is somehow s supremely sacred. It's untouchable. Right. But he started a program. It was called the Coming Out Program, where he invited um, priests, pastors, imams, gurus, rabbis, whoever, whatever, it didn't matter the religious faith, to safely and securely come out with their doubts. Mm -hmm. And he was thinking, just in the United States, man, maybe there'd be a, a couple of dozen mm -hmm. who would share their story. And what this was geared towards were pastors and priests who were full-time ministers, okay. but had to hide their agnosticism, their atheism, their deconstructionism, uh, because yeah. their degrees, their yeah. education, their experience, they had sort of painted themselves into this professional corner. Like, I can't do anything else. Um, so I just have to kind of go through the motions. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was along the lines of like 15,000 wow. people signed up to say, yeah, I work full time as a minister, but I have these questions that I, I have no one to talk to about. Sure. And it's a sad situation. Uh, um, and that's why coming here has been like this breath of fresh air for me that I could actually like stretch out. <laughs> you know, these, these intellectual muscles that for so long, especially growing up in the, the Bible belt, mm -hmm. um, you just couldn't, you couldn't talk about these things. You right. couldn't question substitutionary atonement, right? right? You couldn't question anything about like the ascension or the virgin birth or right. anything like that, because there was something wrong with you. Whereas here, you know, Suncoast is a unicorn in the sense that we're able to engage with these questions and, and help people navigate you know, without ha dictating what they should believe about it. Right. You know? Well, and I, I wanted to ask you, the, and I think we asked this in in, um, in our initial interview with you. Um, we did a, it was a Zoom call. I yep. remember you were you were driving or something. I pulled over. Yeah, you had to pull over and you were just, um, but, you know, with, with all of your education, mm -hmm. um, double master's, PhD, you know, your post-grad at Oxford, normally somebody with your type of education would go in, into the professor route, into mm -hmm. the education route. What, and I know you did that for, yep. for a while. What has brought you back to wanting to be a pastor? That's a, that's, that's a good question. I think um, I love people. I love people. And I love my students. Um, but if you know anything like academia, like it's very hard to get a full-time professorial position, very hard. So like for the last five or six years, I was adjuncting at multiple colleges. I think I made the joke in staff, like last year I had, I had seven W-2s, like oh. seven, because I was teaching at this college and this college, I was teaching online at three, these three colleges and working part-time at a church. And it, it just, it was overwhelming. But I loved it. I loved being a professor. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, there was just this relational disconnect. I had all of these students, but I still felt, I don't know how you call it, I call it like crowded loneliness, right? Yeah. I'm around hundreds of students every semester, you know, helping change minds, helping... Expand. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Like I, I, I say corrupting the youthful minds, yeah. like, like Plato and Socrates. But there was the, that was as far as it could go, right? Once they left the class, hey, good luck with everything. And there was it'd leave like a void, right? Sure. You spend a year, you know, or a semester building a relationship with these students, and then and they're gone, and then they're gone. And it's and it was cool. That was just the reality of the situation. Yeah. And and then being a divorcee myself, you know, I had my kids who lived just five minutes away from me, so I was always sort of reticent about looking outside. And so I, I, that's when I went back into kind of ministry part-time. 
And um, one day, my my wife Esther, who's who, who we've been married since December, you know, we're newlyweds, and she just kind of challenged me. She said, "You maybe maybe it's time to pray and think about looking outside academia mm -hmm. to what you're good at, and maybe even outside of Texas." where you're comfortable at. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dang it. <laughs> you might be right. Yeah. And so I did. I honestly, I, I fervently prayed. I was like, I just, I need direction. I need clarity of thought. Um, Cause I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to have to move away from my kids and then regret it. Right. Um, who, who, who gives a crap about pride or whatever. So I said, what am I good at? I'm good at teaching. I'm good at relationship. I'm good at community building. And I said, maybe ministry, because I had told myself, I'm not going back into full-time ministry. Hmm. Um, and I said, but if I do that, it has to be a very, very particular kind of church. It has to fit into to this paradigm where I, I currently find myself. And I said, and I'm open to move, open to move, but it has to be in a location that I'm just going to find peace. Right. And... Um, one day, just on a whim, I went to church staffing and I uh, just typed in, what are you looking for? I, I, I didn't have an interest in being a senior pastor or student pastor. I just clicked teaching pastor. Mm -hmm. Like, let me teach. Let me rock the house. And I saw Suncoast Community Church, Sarasota, Florida. I said, where is that? <laughs> and I was like, oh, what? Yeah. What? It's best so I go, yeah. yeah, I Googled it and yeah. I saw the beaches and I was like, peace. Yeah. And the first line of that, that ad was, we are not an evangelical or fundamental Christian church. Mm -hmm. We are progressive in our thought and understanding. And I was like, this can't be real. And I said, but it's... I, so immediately I'm going back to my, my home in Dallas because most progressive churches in Dallas, like I worked at a progressive church, which I loved, mm -hmm. but most progressive churches that have a progressive theology have a liturgical form of worship. It's, right. it's hymns yeah. and a chancel choir, nothing against that dude. I love it. Yeah. And I said, it's, this is probably that kind of church, right. you know, nobody, nobody rocks out and <laughs> go, you know. And so I Googled you, I started stalking you, and then I saw the worship set. And I, that's where I first saw you and the band. And I said, holy crap, there's, there's no way. This is a unicorn. This would never, this couldn't happen in Dallas. Yeah. Uh, maybe somewhere else, but here. And so that's when I sent the CV, I sent my cover letter. And I think it was like next day. Yeah, it was really quick. Larry just wrote back and was like, hey, bro, I'm intrigued that you can't be real. And I'm like, no, you can't be real. And <laughs> Felt so a little serendipitous for sure. It was, it was yeah. pretty, it was pretty, you know, the coinky dink, man. And, you know, um, I, I really, after that, after I pulled over into that church parking lot and had the, the Zoom call with you guys, I told Esther and I said, this, this may be something we, we want to entertain. And uh, yeah, man, it, and one thing led to another. And the moment I knew we were going to fly out to visit is when I got my kids involved in that decision process. We mm -hmm. pulled them in. We said, here's a possibility. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not an actuality yet, but you guys are going to be a part of this and daddy's thought process. I'm going to bounce stuff off of you. And dude, they like bought into that. Yeah. They felt like we are a part of this. And then when we, when we flew back home. Um, after the interview? After the interview, okay. when Esther and I came out that weekend, like I came out hugely skeptical. Like, yeah. let's just go, yeah. you know, I gotta get reimbursed for these flights anyway. You know, let's just go check it out. Yeah. It'll be fun. Did not expect to feel the way we felt. Not just for me, who, who was coming, who was gonna be employed, but for my wife who just felt love because she doesn't have a Christian background. Mm. Like her, her dealings with church were just sort of sporadic. Okay. And I guess I'm a Christian. And, and so the way that this church has 
just in that short amount of time, the way your wife made her feel texting her and just saying, man, it was awesome to meet you guys. She never experienced that before from a church. Um, the church was always, don't do this. Oh, you were where last night? And yeah. so for her, this completely shifted her paradigm, which is important for me. And so we go back and I just remember the kids, we took the kids out for some Cajun food <laughs> and they're asking, how was it? And so we start showing them pictures and we start telling them about the church and what daddy would be doing at the church and what we saw and who the people we met. And we said, what do you guys think? Would you guys be willing to like make a two hour flight once a month to hang out with us for a long weekend? And then Esther and I fly back to you guys maybe once a month, do summer vacations there yeah. when I get you for the summer. And they were like, let's do it. <laughs> so I was like, let's call, let's call Dr. Balcom. Yeah. And so we FaceTimed him and we were all sitting on the couch and me and the kids. And uh, he calls and he's like, what's up? And we were just sitting there and I just said, you guys ready? And all together, we just said, we're moving to Florida. <laughs> and he was like, yeah. yeah. So we were definitely holding our breath. For yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah, man. And we, we knew, we knew there were some obstacles uh, mm -hmm. in your path before you could accept the position. So, um, I remember you texting me and saying like, just wanted to be the first to tell you yeah, dude. But I, I wasn't honest with you, though. I'm going to admit it right now. Uh-oh. Larry already had called me and said... Ah! <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, he was just so excited. Yeah, and, man. Um, and, and just to give, you know, kind of from our perspective on that whole situation is um, we knew we were... You know, Larry's been for a long time... He, I mean, he's been a pastor. He's been preaching for 40 years. He's tired. Yeah. And, and you know, and I have a very small taste of it, you know, yep. when I speak on stage, it's exhausting. It is. And I, I remember the first time I spoke on stage, it was a, within a dialogue, so it wasn't even a monologue, which I consider even more prep, more exhausting, is that I remember leaving church on Sunday, and, and the amount of prep that went into just a 25, 30-minute dialogue, and leaving church on Sunday afternoon and being like, I can't imagine having to do that all over again, mm -hmm. all over again. And he's done that consistently yeah. for 40 years. Amazing. He's, he's exhausted. He's tired. And Amazing. so, so one of the things that he's, he's wanting to do is, is speak less. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are people that are like, Oh, you need to speak every week. And he's like, if you want me to be around, <laughs> I got to speak less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I we were that. very, you know, we were very meticulous with the search process. Mm -hmm. Obviously, We've had some issues with other hires in the past, um, and so it was something that um, we had to be very, very honest and very meticulous with, and we had some great interviews uh, with a lot of great people, and, um, you know, just just to bring up um, this one guy, his name's uh, Sean, I mm -hmm. believe. Um, he was an incredible speaker. Um, he's, he's actually from Texas as well. Nice. And... Um, I just, I remember having the conversation with him and he's just like, I feel like I'm without a home. He's like, mm -hmm. I can't be honest with my faith. I can't be honest with who I am. And he's like, I just, you know, the, so it was, it was, you know, it felt like almost like a refugee yeah. and you know, you're just like, I want to bring you in just to have you here. Yeah. Um, but you know, when we had all the candidates, like the final candidates in place, you just, you stuck out the furthest oh, man. and we, and we just so connected with you on that personal level, um, outside of just, you know, you being able to speak and being on the same page theologically, um, it was that connection that really sealed the deal. You're, you're very relational, mm -hmm. um, and you're good at community and you can just tell that even with yeah. your, when you came for the weekend, just to interview, you were out in the grand hall, you were working it, you were yeah. sitting in the front row, both services. Um, and it was just, you could just tell your passion is there, yeah. you know, not only for God, but for people. Mm -hmm. And I just love that. And, uh, and I know that impressed Larry as well. Um, but I, I pinched myself when I heard you were coming man. because I was just so excited for what the possibility is going to be. That means a lot, man. Yeah, absolutely. I just, you know, yeah, it's one thing because churches can often sort of self isolate from the community in which they, you know, are embedded. Mm -hmm. But, dude, like I was out last night, you know, having, you know, I had a couple of beers with Pastor Brett, 
And uh, he went off home. And I said, man, I'm going to go. It's a little early. I'm going to go. <laughs> so I went to, the, to just a little oak and stone right there. Yeah. And, dude, by the end, I had, like, five people around me. Yeah. And one of the guys knew Pastor Larry. Oh, really? And so I text Larry. It's like 930 at night. I'm like, hey, man, do you know a guy named you know, Kermit? And he's like, I know him well. Is he back in town? I said, yeah. I said, he's coming to Suncoast Sunday. I said, I told so all you're these. you're already, you're already oh, dude, out there. Like, let's go. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, you know, Brett had said something d- during our conversation. He goes, man, I guarantee you there are 2,000 people in this city who have been to Suncoast and they just need an invitation back. Absolutely. They just need to be invited back. Yeah. Like, hey, we've we've gone past a bunch of this craziness that whatever the past was. And right. they just need an invitation back. And do this. I'm making it my personal mission, like part of my own job description to invite every person I can. Yeah. Not for the sake of just the church growing, but like for the sake of truth, right? right. Like come hear the truth. Right. And find it, you know? Yeah. And it, it's been amazing, man. The, the community, even just in Sarasota, the friendliest people I've ever met. Really? Well, like, that's awesome. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. I've, I've lived here my whole life, so I just don't know. It's, I don't know very much about like other communities. You know, and it's easy for me as sort of a quasi, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a hybrid quasi introverted, extroverted, because, dude, I love my books and mm-hmm. I love to read and I love to get in my little quiet space and just think and write. But when I'm out, like, that's who I am. Yeah. Like, there's no pretentiousness. There's, it's, I try to be as authentic as I can. And here, here I am, you know, where are you from? You just moved here from where? From Dallas. What do you do? I'm a teaching pastor at, at a church having a couple of beers. And it just, you can immediately see the incongruent presupp we call them tacit assumptions and unarticulated presuppositions that they have about what a sure, pastor absolutely you're not supposed to have tattoos on right. your arm and then there was a young couple sitting behind me last night you know because i'm sitting here talking with with kermit the the bartender and inviting him back to suncoast and he's telling me about his three kids and about how pastor larry gave him like a piece of wood from the holy land that he still has on his dresser at home and just like moving things that this church has done in this community and i'm sometimes you just got to be reminded right yeah. you just got to remind people remember that piece of wood right and now come back right come back and hang out yeah and uh there was a young couple like super young probably mid-20s and um i just kind of turned around and i the guy caught my my eye, you know, because I'm sitting, I got my hat on backwards, and and he's like, dude, where'd you get that artwork from? I said, you'll never believe this, but my tattoo artist, and I can't, I just moved here from Dallas. She's like a 55 year old lady who will rock your world. I said, she's the only one I would let. It's the only one you trust. That's the only one I trust. I yeah. said, I'm trying to find someone in Sarasota because I have an idea, and he was like, what do you want? So I pulled up a picture of Frederick Nietzsche, a portrait that I want to get. He's like, oh, that's that's Nietzsche. I was like, dude, what do you know about Nietzsche? He's like, man, and you know, and he went to church, not here, but he was he was he went to some other denominational church. And he's like, man, we used, I used to read a little bit of Nietzsche, and man, my my youth pastor was like, don't don't mess with that, don't mess with that. I said, yeah. dude, Nietzsche will rock your world. Yeah, I don't understand why philosophy and theology have to kind of be at odds. I mean, Jesus was a philosopher. Oh yeah. Like, he, he, <laughs> that's what he did. Oh, he was the best. He was the best. The best at it. Yeah. And so he, he actually sent me contact to his tech cause he had a bunch of tattoos that were just boss. And he goes, man, I go to oddity tattoo. Yeah. That's and, a spot. That's where I got my tattoos. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, man, ask for this guy. And if they're not that guy. And so I had this conversation and he, and he, on his own volition, he went now, what do you do again? You're a pastor? I said, I'm a teaching pastor at Suncoast. He goes, where is that? I said, dude, stay on this road, cross 75, you're about two miles. It'll be right there on your right. And you'll just see the sign. It says love wins. And he was like, sweet. And so he was there with his girlfriend and I was like, come as well. Like, it'd be great to see you guys. I said, we call it the way I kind of describe it. I, I steal this from the pastor. I said, it's a rock concert. And then a TED Talk. Right. He was like, yeah, I, lo- I love <laughs> TED Talks, man. Yeah. But, and again, man, there's no pressure. No. There's, there, there is, like you, you guys sing on Sunday. Come as you are. Just come. Right. And uh, again, man, I, you know, it's just my mission to 
I think, again, it's part of my job description. Yeah, you're going to see me on Sunday morning and the, you know, the sermon is going to blow your mind and it's going to be exciting and impassioned when I speak and all that stuff. But more than that, I want to live it. Right. I want to live it. So yeah. going back to my dissertation, excarnation is the title of my dissertation, which is the antithesis of incarnation. And so when you read the Gospel of John, it says the word became flesh, right? Incarnate. So in other words, the logos, mm -hmm. the truth became embodied in the person of Jesus. Now, excarnation is the reversal of that. It's a bunch of flesh that are just all about words, right. doctrines and creeds. Right. Say the right thing. That's it. Yeah. I want to embody, I want to incarnate that logos in my life, wherever I am. If I'm having a couple of drinks at a pub, if I'm on the front row, I want to incarnate the truth, you know, have my hands lifted and just, again, I think, you know, we talked, I sent you a little thing yesterday. It, it's not about the place. It's about the point of right. worship, right? right? I can worship anywhere. Like, dude, I go to Siesta Key, I'm chilling on the beach, mm -hmm. hearing those waves. That's a moment of worship for me, right? right? Because I recognize the point of it. And, um, and that's how I want to. That's how I want to live, man. That's how I want to be yeah. in the world. Yeah. So I mean, and obviously, worship is a, has a very special place in my heart. I've been doing it since I was 15 years old. Yeah, man. Um, and there are, it is something that keeps me grounded in my faith. Is those experiences that I have with singing these words and just worshiping with other people. And um, so, I how just, do you, after, for doing it? Yeah, you know, I mean, you haven't done it 40 years, right? But it takes it out of you as well, man. I I play guitar and have mm -hmm. led worship, not singing, but yeah. How do you prevent burnout? Honestly, man, it's just something I love. You're doing it week in and week out. I just love it so much. Yeah. I love it. Like, it, it's just, it doesn't feel exhausting. It doesn't feel like work. Um, not that I don't love speaking, because I, I really do. Mm -hmm. But I, I really feel like my strength is is music, because that's what I love to do. Yeah. Um, and leading people into a, a worship experience is something that, it motivates me. It drives me. Like, yeah. Like I said, I've been doing it since I was 15 years old, almost every single weekend. Sure, I take weekends off, and there was a time in my life I took a year off stage to kind of recalibrate my mm -hmm. mindset. And um, it was conflicting for me because it was uh, I needed it. I really needed that time off stage. But, man, I lost a part of my identity. Mm -hmm. you know. And so that's something for me that it's like music is – part of who I am mm -hmm. and experiencing God in those moments and experiencing community and, and, and helping change people's hearts in that moment. Gosh, that, that drives me. Yeah. You know? It's, it's, it, yes, I'm tired after Sundays. Yeah. Sure. But I'm ready to do it again. Yeah. Let's go again. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's just one of those things that it's just, it drives me. It's, yeah. it's not exhausting and I'll do it until as long as I'm not just like the, the old guy on stage trying to be cool. Yeah, man. You know, but um, I wanted to chat with you a little bit about because we've a lot of us around here have gone through a deconstruction process, and, mm -hmm. and we all kind of have our own stories. What sparked kind of your deconstruction process in the sense of like what was like those first few questions that started to challenge your mind and your faith? Yeah, I th it was. I think it was my time at Criswell, and I was writing my master's thesis for the, for the theology piece. Okay. And I chose to focus on theodicy, so the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, I think that's where the disconnect initially, you know. The, the question of about like a God. Suffering, yeah. Right. Like, like, a good, all-powerful, all the omnis, right? right and right. then just the prevalence, not just the existence, but mm -hmm. the prevalence of, of evil and suffering. And so I read everything I could to try to, I guess, avert that deconstructive momentum. Mm -hmm. I mean, I read guys like William Lane Craig, mm -hmm. Alvin Plantinga, yeah. um, Anselm, mm -hmm. like all of these people who've attempted to try to give some sort of philosophical, theological, rational reason why it's this God can't exist in light of right. and not in lieu of mm -hmm. evil. So that was the first one. And I just, I just came, I mean, I, th I think I got a C, which is passing, barely passing on that paper. Uh, 
and you know my the professor just marked it all up I'm like no, he just this, didn't like what he was it saying. basically was this is not biblical theology this is not you know right. um and so that was the initial sort of outside of my first philosophy class with 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 dr levi um but that was just more i'm coming back to get you type yeah, thing yeah. but then when i really began to get inundated and immersed into the the field of philosophical theology and mm -hmm. so that was the first piece and i realized there's there's no way that i can somehow um reconnect this idea of god and this the actual nature of reality right, right. metaphysically yeah and so you just kind of come to a conclusion, well, reality is not changing, right? Evil's still here. So either this has to change mm -hmm. or I just have to have some of this, I guess, um, intellectual dissonance, right? I have to distance myself right. from that. And Which is a story that a lot of people, like a lot of pastors that go through higher education and scholarship have to, to, to position themselves. They almost have to forget what they learned that's just right. to, to keep their job. That's exactly right. And so it was at that point I began to uh, be exposed to other lines of thought, mm -hmm. not in Christianity, but, you know, s some of the more anti, anti theist like okay. Dawkins and yeah. Hitchens and Harris and Dennett. And uh, I really dove into some of those works, um, not with a mind that it's either God or nothing, right. but there has to be some way to reconcile this that's the hardest part about deconstruction right and, it's the reconciliation oh yeah yeah and it was um i think reading bart ehrman mm. where <laughs> yeah like reading misquoting jesus or yeah. god's problem right where, jesus interrupted was the one for me that was really yeah uh, gosh he messed me up oh, for man. a long time yeah i mean textual criticism is where we, we, we you that's where the light came on right. the problem's not with god no the problem's with what's said about god correct and what has become sort of what, what you know what the what inerrant right or infallible whatever whatever moniker you want to place upon the scripture right. and so that i saw that as the root is that we have a misunderstanding so that's why you know i did three years of greek and then three years of hebrew to kind of yeah. sort that stuff out for myself right and that's larry did the same I, I don't know how many years but he also you know went through the greek and hebrew and he understands that stuff you yeah. know when you can go at least go as close to the source as you possibly can and actually read the text it's that's it. very helpful in your study absolutely yeah and so that was part of that. And I just I found a peace in that. Yeah. Uh, and it, it caused conflict in other areas of my life. Sure. Um, when you begin to say things like, yeah, homosexuality is not a sin. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Muslims go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And you begin to challenge the very foundations of that sort of evangelical fundamental sort of positioning. And you have you have really good arguments. Mm -hmm. Like I tell students all the time, I don't I don't. This is what I say in my, my intro to philosophy class every year. I don't care what you are. I don't care what you believe. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't care what I believe. If you're a Buddhist, atheist, Christian, whatever, by the end of this class, I want you to be the best whatever you are. Yeah. I say that every year. I want you to be the best whatever you are. So don't come with me with I believe and opine. Mm -hmm. Come with an argument. Come with an argument. Not in the sense of I'm here to be the devil's advocate or, mm -hmm. you know, sort of your antagonist. If you believe in God, I want to help you have a good reason to believe in God. Because there are good reasons to believe in God. And if you don't want to believe in God, there are great reasons to not believe in God. Mm -hmm. And I'm not biased either way. But what we want to do is have an argument. Mm -hmm. And what I saw that as, as strange or contradictory as it sounds, I saw that as a value of Suncoast when I first saw the website. We're a hospital, not a courtroom. My philosophy classroom was never a courtroom. Right. It was a hospital for thinking. Mm. That's the way I viewed it. It was a hospital to correct your thinking, right? And it would, it would happen in just little ways. Like a student would say, ah, oh, you know, doctor, do you say, I, there is no truth. <laughs> is that true? Oh, so... We got one. Yeah. <laughs> there may be others, right? Maybe, you have to right. be. And it was always fun to see those light bulbs go on. Yeah. Like, oh, crap. 
he's right. Yeah. Well, especially when you're dealing with young, um, young adults like that. I remember how I was. I, fig- I, I had life figured out by 18. Yeah. I was, I knew everything about the world. And, uh, as you get older, you realize, yeah, I don't know anything. That's right on. <laughs> and I think there, there was a, there was a monumental moment. I'm not going to mention the church I was working at, but I was a youth minister at a, at a large, pretty large church. And I, we had a big youth group and one of my students got pregnant. Mm. She was the 10th grade. And I decided we're not going to, we're not going to ostracize her. She's, she's going to be welcome here. Even at nine months, she's going to be welcome to worship within her community. Was that even a conversation within the church? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like we just can't be coming. Can't be coming. What? So true story, man. I walked alongside her the whole, and her parents, because her parent, one of her parents worked at the church and was like beside herself. Sure. And I said, look, you have to worry about me. Mm -hmm. She's welcome. And if anybody says anything, I'm going to approach it. So what this did, what this is, this is how I think God works, right? Mm -hmm. The school district made her go to alternative school. It wasn't even a question. Once Mm -hmm. you found out you're pregnant, you had to go to alternative school at a different location. So you wouldn't be a distraction for the student population. So she had to go to these classes in the evening and, um, she'd go in and a lot of these pregnant girls were there with their partners or whoever. And she'd go and she's like, would you come with me? And so my wife, we were like, yeah, we'll go with you. So my wife and I would go. And I remember walking into this room and they're literally, they're like 40 girls in there because it's a huge school district. And I'm looking around this really dilapidated freaking room. It's supposed to, you know, sort of, foster education for these people. And here comes the director, this beautiful Hispanic woman. And uh, I introduced myself. I said, hey, I'm Troy. I'm the youth minister at this church. And she's one of our students. And we're just kind of partnering with her to support her. And I was like, like, don't you guys offer any sort of resources for these students? Mm -hmm. I mean, you you give other students textbooks and meals and what? She goes, yeah, our resource closet's over here. It was like a little hole in the wall, nothing in it. A few milk formulas were a few diapers. Right. Dude, my heart broke. Sure. Broke. I was like, where's the freaking church? Yeah. Where's the church? I was vehement. Mm -hmm. I was... I was pissed off. So I go back to my church staff and I said, I went there and here's what I saw. And I said, no one's stepping in to help these people. They feel like they've made the worst mistake of their life. They feel like they, they should have some sort of penance for their sin. Yeah. And I was like, F that. I was like, here's what I want to do. I want to have a baby shower for the ISD pregnant mother's alternative education program. We can't, we can't do that. If we do that, we're going to be saying that premarital sex is okay. Do you think it's not happening? Cause I was in a room with 40 young ladies, 40 who, who feel already like they're a piece of crap. Yeah. And I go, I want them to feel loved and accepted. I met the director who just feels like they just stuck me out here and you deal with them. I was like, that's not Christ. That's not what Jesus was about. Well, and you, and you have a situation like that, and you think, did you read the Bible at all? Yeah, like, come did on. Did you read like, come on, dude. the story of Christ at all? Like, let's go. And so what ultimately happens is we, we agree, and we put it out there. And, of course, there were noisemakers. I, there were maybe people who left the church. But that Sunday comes, and... Ricardo, our stage was full, <laughs> cribs and clothes. And, and I made sure to say, don't bring me your crap stuff. Mm-hmm. New or keep it home. Yeah. Diapers, car seats. Dude, Miss Monique, the director, sitting on the front row, just bawling her eyes out. She, right. And she goes, I don't know where I'm going to put all this. <laughs> and I was like, we, we'll help you. Yeah. But dude, that's part of it, right? right? And even that was, I was, that's when I, I was in Criswell at the time, completing my master's degree. And um, when that transpired. So even that episode of fighting against this 
this sort of conservative fundamentalist idea, right. even regarding teen pregnancy, really raised questions for me. And but it was part of my process right. and part of my deconstruction, man. Right. But um, we prevailed in. I think to this day, the church still still does the baby shower for That's that amazing. program. So, but yeah, I mean, sometimes you just, you have to stand up, you know, for, for it, what's true. Right. You know? And it's, and it's really difficult, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's would have been so much easier for you to just be like, that sucks. Yeah. And then move on with your life. But you're, you're wanting, if your purpose in this life, and this is one of the things we really try to focus on is being as Christ-like as possible. Yeah. You know, what did Christ do? He didn't condemn. He didn't shame. He he picked those people up. They were buried in their own shame. Yep. I mean, Mary, I just the immediate story was Mary Magdalene. Like, he came beside her and he stopped what they were doing, about yep. to kill her. You know, and he yep. picked her up and he walked alongside her That's and it. he loved her. Why, if Christ Himself is not going to yeah. sit there and throw stones and condemn her? Yeah. What gives you the right? That's right on. You know, like it's not that by supporting these young women, it doesn't get, it's not saying, oh, I give you permission to do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. No, it's by like through all, like this is the story of the prodigal son. No matter what you do, yeah. I am running towards you. That's right. And I am loving you. And that's, and you know, Josh Blanks just spoke this past weekend, you know. That was and, tremendous, man. And, and he talks about this idea of like, we're authentic not holy, yeah. you know, and the church loses its way a lot of times in this obsession with correct thinking mm -hmm. because eternity's on the line. Yeah. <laughs> so their number one goal is I got to make sure that I'm correct in my thinking That's right. and to not question, you know, and this is a newer phenomenon. This is not something that the church has been founded in and based in. That's right. You know, this is something that's new within this thing that we call Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can provide a place where people can be authentic and be honest about who they are yep. and, and the things that they've done and the, and the mess ups, and we can come alongside them and support them and love them and be as Christ like as we possibly can. That's right. That's our job. That's it, man. That's it. Dude, that's, that's for me, what you just described is technological thinking, right? This idea is as long as I believe the right things, I'm good. Yeah. I can believe helping the homeless is good. Just don't ask me to freaking do it. That's the disconnect, right? right. It's right. it's excarnational, right? right? Incarnation says, I believe this is good, I have to do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's that for me is that's my heartbeat, man, is like it's not just this idea of what you practice what you preach. I mean, it's it's too simplistic. But you talked about walking along people. Dude, that's that requires something of you because we technological thinking again, not to be pretentious and talk about my academic work, but we get pissed off if we wait in a drive through line too long yeah. or if our computer takes too long to download something, right. we want it quick, instantaneous. Whereas bro, walking with someone toward the love of God could take years, yeah. years. And if you're not ready for that commitment, then 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 you then you don't fully understand the love of god right in 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 how we need to appropriate and understand that yeah it's a commitment man yeah and you know i've been walking with some friends back home in dallas we still communicate who don't believe in god right um and i don't find it to be my job to convert them convert them yeah. or prove to them by some sort of rational logical apologetical argument I go, dude, just look at my life. Look at my life. I've made awful mistakes, but they always have seen, man, he's come back. He's made a comeback. And I attribute that to, again, my trust in, in who God is and what I feel my calling is to show the world this, this love. And um, not perfect by any means, man. Uh, but one of my friends who's an who's a atheist, I was going through a very dark time as I was going through my divorce and he'd call and check on me and he was, he'd say something like, man, don't lose your faith, man. Don't lose your faith. Really? He would tell straight up atheist guy wow. like, and a PhD smart guy. And I was like, what do you mean? man?" I was like, I'm losing my faith, man. Like nothing's working. Nothing's, yeah. nothing's going my way. And he told me something. He goes, 
bro. He goes, don't lose your faith. He goes, because in the end, I need you to have faith enough for the both of us. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I get that. I wow. get that. Yeah. And that's like moving to me, man. You yeah. know, it was like there, there is a type of responsibility if you claim to be a Christian that comes along with that. Yeah. But it's not this responsibility to uphold some doctrine or institutional dogma. Correct. It's, it's the responsibility to be like every day. Yeah. I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to be better than I was yesterday. And I can only do that by focusing on particular examples. And I think the best example is always going to be, be Jesus. Um, so yeah, man. And people see it, people watch. Yeah. And, uh, I think that was, a even just going back to my own story, as far as like the deconstruction process, you know, I look at it as like, kind of like, a like a graph, you know, I, I had this stack of beliefs that I considered, you know, like my foundation for what I believed. And as they like started to just fall away, you know, and, and there were some that were easier to let go of than others. Mm -hmm. Like hell was a really, really easy one for me yeah. to let go of the idea of eternal suffering for people that haven't even heard the story of right. Christ is just, I, I couldn't wrap my head around that. <laughs> I always struggled with that idea, but it was just something that you were just told, this is how it is. Yep. This is a faith. So Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, just yep. transformed my thought and I was yep. ready to let that one go because yep. that's part of the trauma for mm -hmm. my, <laughs> for my childhood is, you know, I had, um, I had this fear, just this overarching fear of my life like that. I had to pray for all my sins before I went to bed, just in case I died yep. in the middle of the night. Or and and I'd just be like, "Oh man, I hope I got them all." You know, I hope I got them all. And and, yep. and then and then I had this other irrational fear of like, if I was in a car accident and I said like a curse word right before I died, <laughs> that I'd be like doomed to hell yeah, forever. Yeah, you're done. So I, I stripped away the hell really, really easily. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea, you know, what you just, you talked about earlier, the, the atonement theories. I mm -hmm. didn't even know about atonement theory. Just, yep. I, I didn't know what the word meant prior to my deconstruction process. And then understanding like, okay, there's like nine other atonement yeah. theories. Yeah. And, you know, this one, the one that ha populates modern, you know, evangelicalism is, is kind of the, the worst of all of right. them. And it's the newest idea of all of them. And so it's like, you know, if, if I can, if I can let go of this like bloodthirsty God that requires bloodshed, a sacrifice, which if you even look at the story of the Bibles, like yep. the, the Bible, like there's plenty of times that God doesn't, that he's literally stopping people that's from right. sacrificing that's things right. and just saying like, this is not what I require. And that's, that's right. what Jesus came to change minds about. That's right. So that was easy to let go of. Um, and then it was just the other things and, and, and I, I blame Bart Ehrman a lot for yeah, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because when I started looking into the Bible, which I, I considered the foundation of my faith, you know, it's amazing how the Bible almost becomes, um, God itself. Yeah. It's an idol. Yeah. It's an idol. It's this thing that you hold to its highest regard. And when I started looking into how the Bible was compiled and who the authors were and, 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 and it's just something that you, I never thought about. Like, it's not something that I ever put any of attention to because mm -hmm. I just thought the Bible just came down yeah, from yeah. heaven perfectly, <laughs> you know, and just given to the people. And, that's and, right. and then when you realize, like, that's not how it was, you know, it was very human hands that compiled the, wrote these books and that's compiled right. this, this whole thing. And we can go through the, we won't bore people with going through the, the yeah. whole history, but... When, when I read Bart Ehrman's, I, I read one textbook of his, I can't remember the name, and then I read Jesus Interrupted. Mm -hmm. And I remember that at the end of those books just being like, this is all fake. Mm. This is all fake. Mm -hmm. And I entered this, like, I stripped everything away, right? And I entered, I, I became an atheist. I mm -hmm. became, like, there's no such thing as God. Mm -hmm. Like, there's just no, there, like, Jesus wasn't real. Right. There's no such thing as God. Um, and that for me, and not saying that this is true for every atheist, but it led to nihilism. Mm -hmm. It led to hopelessness. It led to this life that just felt meaningless. Yep. And yep. I was miserable, like just absolutely miserable. Yeah. And I didn't want to stay there. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, it was honestly, it was people like Jordan Peterson, um, people like even William Lane Craig, mm -hmm. a, a, as much as he is pretty fundamental in a lot mm -hmm. of his beliefs, he, they, they helped me reconstruct yeah. 
something. And that's like always my biggest advice to people is like, don't deconstruct without reconstructing something oh, yeah. else. Just be very, very careful and don't hold anything dogmatically mm-hmm. or at least not, maybe not anything, but not too many things. That's right. That your your faith can be just tipped over by one of those blocks being yeah. being thrown out. That's right on. Um, that was like the, the the scariest part of that whole process was just the nihilism, the hopelessness, and guys like you, guys like Pastor Larry, guys like Brett, who are much smarter than I am, much just deeper thinkers, have really helped me reconstruct mm-hmm. this idea of God. And it, I'm okay with not having all the answers. Yeah. And I think that's where it's, that's been the most freeing thing is being able to let go of this need to be certain about yeah. certain things. And that was even Peter N's books, book, The Sin of Certainty. Yeah. That one really helped Dude, me come was, out uh, of it. Amazing. You know? And this, this idea of like, if I can just be as Christ like as possible, yeah. let me just focus on that. Yeah. If I can just focus on that and not necessarily, being so hyper obsessed with like having correct thinking, That's right. then nothing else really matters. But the thing I stand against is the church doing trauma mm-hmm. to people in the name of God. Yep. And them saying, this is the way God is. Yeah. It's right on. It's just, it, it, that's the only thing that really, that frustrates me. Right. And, and that's not villainizing the church. No. And, and this is, this is something I have said repeatedly. Like there are evangelical brothers and sisters of mine that I absolutely love, and they're mm-hmm. some of the best people I know. Same. They just haven't gone through that journey. Same. You know, and yeah. so I, I try to talk to them and I try to to help them. But you know, when when we interviewed you, we laid it all out on the table. Oh yeah. We said this is who we are. Yep. And you said, I love it. Let's go. Let's go. And that was something that five five or six years ago when we had the document um, situation happen, it was astounding to me the level that people would go to um, because they thought we were terrible people. And we, and, and it yeah. felt so isolating. Yeah. And it still does, you know, but mm-hmm. what really encouraged me during this interview process is I talked to a lot of, a lot of different pastors. I talked to friends of mine that went to seminary. Mm-hmm. And they were just so encouraged by what Suncoast is mm-hmm. because they're like, this is unique. Yep. I can't believe you guys exist. Yep. And I think that was what kept, kept me going because this, especially in this community, Suncoast has a reputation. Yeah, We're a bunch of heretics. Yeah, <laughs> Larry doesn't believe in the Bible. Yeah. Larry doesn't believe in Jesus. And, and, and it's, it's like, it's so wild. Mm-hmm. Because this is being said by people that don't even come here. That's right. That don't have not listened to one sermon of yeah. Larry's. And if you look at that man and you look at the staff and you look at the community, like nothing could be further from the That's truth. That's right on. I and agree. so it was so encouraging to see, to have a conversation with you initially and just be like, you know, here's what we got. This is, this is kind of the things that we believe. And, and you're like, well, yeah, that's just scholarship. Yeah, because that some people like literally, I think a lot of people in town think these ideas just came from Larry, yeah. and that he's like created his own religion, and he's just yeah. like some of the Yelp, uh, some yeah. of the some of the Yelp Larry reviews. Larry created his own religion, yeah, and it's, it's like yeah. you no, know, this is just scholarship. No, no, this is just we're just trying to be as intellectually honest with you That's right. as we possibly can. That's right. And so, just even just the our initial conversation was just so encouraging to me. Like, okay. That's Let's it. keep going. Yeah, man. We got this. Um, so I, I couldn't be more happy to have you here, man. Oh, man. I couldn't be happier to be here. Like, this is, it's unreal. It's, uh, you know, I pinch myself every morning. You know, we're in paradise. This it's is not a, a bad place to oh, be, Oh, it's right? not a bad place. Yeah. And and it's a, it's a dream job at a dream place that, that's, it's a church that's actually doing stuff in the community to make a difference, you know, and that's... Uh, I'm honored, privileged, you know, well, to, to be right a part. Back at you, man. We're, we're honored to have you, and um, I'm sure that this is the first of many uh, podcasts that we'll be doing together. Heck um, yeah! Because we've had multiple conversations that last multiple hours, and yeah. we just like, all right, well, we got to we got to go do something go. else. But, um, dude, thank you so much for being here. We're so excited, and I hope this this podcast will help um, 
people understand who you are and hear your heart. And uh, I hope that they're, I know they will be excited awesome, to man. hear you speak. Can't wait. Thanks, man. Awesome.